The Career Musician Podcast with creator and host, Nomad. With 20 plus years of experience in the music industry, Nomad has done just about everything to earn a living as a career musician. From being music director to celebrity artists, playing iconic arenas and stadiums, composing for film and TV, and even playing your average local club gigs, he's done it all. Nomad's mission is to empower musicians across the globe with strategies for a sustainable career while blasting stereotypes, and to bring you tried and true wisdom from his colleagues in this crazy business we call music. On this episode of the Career Musician Podcast, we have Jay Deal. Jay Deal has worked with a bevy of amazing artists, including but not limited to Janet Jackson, Elton John, Lady Gaga, Queen Latifah, Snoop Dogg, Joe Jonas, Neo, Mary Mary, Kelly Rowland, Diane Warren, Omarion, Jessica Simpson, Kirk Franklin, MC Light, and Andre Crouch, just to name the ones that are on the credits page of his website. But here's what's really cool about Jay Deal is he's multifaceted as a keyboard player and a bass player but also a mathematician i'll let jay deal himself tell you all about it on this episode of the career musician podcast all right fantastic jay deal welcome to the career musician podcast thanks for having me and thanks for your patience <laughs> it's been a long time coming yeah, it has. Man, I ha- I was sitting here boiling with excitement while we're doing all the technical stuff because there's so many things I want to start talking to you about. And man, I'm just going to start right out the gate. So I feel like we know each other by so many de- degrees of separation. Actually, mm-hmm. not that many degrees because it turns out uh, we've worked with a lot of the same artists. Um, mm-hmm. Over the years, I noticed on your resume, Vicky Winans, T.D. Jakes, Karen Clark Sheard, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so just to name a few. But, wow, super excited to have you here. You are a keyboardist, a bassist, and a mathematician, your website says. I mean, let's come on. That's, that's some heavy stuff right there. <laughs> I do my best, man. I just deal with the cards I've been given. So, you know, are you right. from the Detroit area? No, I'm from New York originally. New York. Okay, so you yeah. probably ran into Kern somewhere along the way, too. Kern, that's right. Yeah, that's yes. how I got introduced to all those artists, so... Yeah, man. I'm sure if we just talk for five minutes about who we know, it's like the same circles of people. Yeah, we'd connect all those dots. Yeah. Man, the first time I met Kern, he was with Mary J. Blige, uh-huh. uh, and I was with Kirk Whalem, uh-huh. and we went to South Africa together. No way, you were there. Yeah, was it the yeah? Were you Ma- the Della thing? Was it that? Yes, yes. Uh, wait, so circa like ninety eight. Yeah, ninety eight, ninety nine. Yeah, ninety nine, right bro. That oh. was an amazing experience. You were there. Yes. Okay. Well, th- it explains it all now, <laughs> bro. So many people were there, like Gordon Campbell. I was with Drew Hill. Right. Oh, so, okay. Gotcha. And Stevie Wonder and them were out there and oh, all that kind right. of good stuff. Yes. That's crazy. Yeah, I'm finding out literally 20 years later, people who were on that experience. It's so crazy. Isn't that something? Yeah, man. Wow, yeah, That was my first time in South Africa. It was gorgeous. Me Such too. a good I, time. Yeah, me too, man. I, yeah. They took us over. Um, we were in some tour bus or something, and we went over the apex of a hill, and it just showed the whole landscape and scenery. Never seen anything that beautiful in my life to this day. Right. Breathtaking. Yeah. Yeah, I know you got a lot to talk about. I'm sorry, man. I'm yeah, rambling. no, we do. No, we we can sit here and reminisce forever. This is beautiful. That's crazy. All right. So first of all, you know, when you go to your website, really well done, by the way, jdeal.net for those who are listening. Um, and J is spelled J A E D E A L dot net. Um, I love the way you have it set up, and the reason why I'm bringing it up is because right off the bat, 
you start with what's kind of like a mission statement or tagline, you know, across several disciplines, visionary, award-winning composer, college professor, mathematician, and global leader. So stellar creative execution with iconic artists exemplifying integrity, integrity, acumen, and class. This is everything that the career musician embodies. Like it's, I feel like we are such kindred spirits. So that's why I'm leading with this. Okay. Uh, you know, for us to not really be close and have dialogue, although that's going to change now, uh, I, I feel like we're just such kindred spirits. So please expound on this. Tell us a little bit about how you got started and how you were able to, you know, pull all these things together mm -hmm. into one force. I think so. That description is a story in itself. I mean, after years of being in the industry and you know the ups and the downs i mean every day is not that synopsis of right. my career like today before right. i got on the car i'm like my daughter's got a headache uh, <laughs> you know that's real life <laughs> that's, stuff. Yeah. that's real life you know and and yeah we haven't hit those um magnificent artist moments today we've we've had none of that today it's just <laughs> uh calling back uh calling uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield about my insurance, stuff, all regular life stuff. But what right. I did was when it was time to redo my website, I just, I had um, a sketch of my biography. And um, I tell a lot of my students, I'm like, you know, look to look for concision because we only get one shot to really make that impression. And people, if they're the more that they have on their plate, they don't have time to read a lot. So I just was like, let me just apply this to myself. And I tried to just simplify and embody everything that I believe that I achieved and aim to continue to achieve in bullet points. And then I put those bullet points together into what's shorter than a paragraph. It's pretty, maybe it's not even sentences. Right. <laughs> That's the other thing. Like bu bullet points, basically. They're bullet yeah. points. Yeah. And so that is a. Uh, that's pretty much, I forgot what the question was exactly, but that speaks to um, just how that description shows up. And it's kind of just some advice for people who are coming up. Um, uh, it's perfect. You, that's that's yeah. the perfect, uh, you know, explanation of, of these uh, concepts and philosophies and items that you have strung together. Um, so, yeah, let's start right at the top. USC adjunct professor. I, I kind of want to focus a little bit on this because that is such a big deal. And for those listeners who aren't hip to, you know, the Los Angeles scene and, and what USC is and, and the level of university, maybe if you could talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, how you got how you got into that gig. Well, Sean Holt brought me in and he does a lot of TV stuff, a lot of movie stuff. That's and right. It's so funny that we were doing a, uh, I'm not going to say what film festival it was, but we, we were doing a local film festival and uh, I was slated to speak in a spot and no one showed up because of some scheduling um, issues within the festival. It was mm -hmm. literally three people in the audience at my ah. slot when it's time to show up. Uh, but I, they said, do you want to speak? I said, I'll do it anyway. I spoke. That's right. Sean heard a little bit of it from the hallway and said, man, let's sit down to lunch. And he was a USC professor already in the pop, pro pop program. And we started to talk. He's like, hey, man, come on and visit sometime. I'll introduce you to Patrice Russian. And that's how it started. So that's how I got in. And if I hadn't been, I guess, open minded enough or just like understand how these things work to talk to three people, I wouldn't have been able to reach thousands of people at USC. Man, uh, so that's that, how I got in. <laughs> that's impactful. Let's talk about that because sometimes people feel like, oh man, there's three people in the room. You know what, guys? Let's just cancel the gig, call it a night. But that's mm -hmm. definitely not the way to go. You know? Yeah, it was a it was a sacrifice um, at the time because I did want to go. I was like, man, and I wouldn't <laughs> have been really, you know, depending on the circumstances, people would have understood. But probably knowing me and what I've to uh, learn to understand, I would have connected with those three people saying, look, here's my information. I, I, I now have the bandwidth to stay in contact with you all personally, since it's That's only right. three of you. But uh, I just was staying open to whatever was coming my way, and, and it happened that way. And I, I approached my USC uh, 
responsibilities much the same way. There is a an art to teaching at a university level, especially a globally ranked university. But at every instance that I can get to make a direct one-to-one -one connection with my students, I go for it. Right, right. And so that's uh, pretty much my experience at, at USC on a, on a very, uh, looking at it from a high level. That's brilliant. Can you tell us a little bit about the, sco the scope of what you teach over there? I am in, uh, my direct um, superior is Rick Schmuck. So he hired me. He's over the production and music technology departments there. So I teach in that vein. I teach an intro to Logic, intro to Pro Tools, a Pro Tools course. Um, and then one of my favorite classes, and I get to say that because others are really, you know, we're, we're just, <laughs> everybody gets the same basics regimented how to use a doll. Um, but one class where I get to be creative and scope out the, uh, skill sets of the students and maximize those is a class called advanced desktop production and it's a 400 level course sometimes I have some master students who need a music technology requirement that they can take this course as an elective and we talk about maximizing the uh, production efficiency and effectiveness mm -hmm. of a producer from a laptop and nice. we go into hybrid production and augmenting um, live sounds with computer sounds and the other way around computer sounds with live so yeah that's and then cool. i have wow. a ton of private students there oh that's awesome uh mm -hmm. piano and bass or or production as well for the private students it's funny man like this school is so big they have all these divisions and subdivisions i have nothing to do with bass at that school <laughs> ah okay great yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so they're just finding out that i play any kind of instruments and there was gotcha. one student that uh rick found out that i do some arrangements he said, hey can you help one of these private students with orchestral arrangement i said well sure and it worked out it nice. worked out but right now i'm primarily doll um you know okay pro tools okay. logic kind of thing Gotcha. Yeah. Well, that's the perfect segue because then I noticed that you've worked with so many big artists as uh, their program, their you know their uh, what you, their playback engineers or built <laughs> helping building the show for their live performances. Talk about that. I mean, just to name one right off the top, Janet Jackson, and you know again the list goes on. So tell us about that if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, um, it was around 2004 when I got my first mac laptop and before then i was watching engineers uh on pro tools and i was really just watching them and studying from afar but i couldn't actually get my hands on a computer until 2004 and that's when i started getting into programming reason and understanding the waves um some of them still very popular today that's when i first had the opportunity to really get into MIDI programming and um, recording my own parts into a, a doll and then editing them. And what I started finding, because back in the day we used to augment uh, these live shows with ADATs, I mean DATs, uh, DA88s. Right. DA88s, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah. Yeah, then the Kais came along, the rack That's mountable right. samplers. And then it was like, yo, we can do this with a computer. If we had right. the right audio interface to get the, all the outs simultaneous. So I just started um, using, taking a laptop and having the two track come out and we would play over that. And then it's got more advanced. And then right. through the relationships that I had of people along the way, like church and jazz clubs, they ascended and they would call me and say, hey, why don't you help us with this aspect of it? And it took a life of its own from there. I love that, man. I love that. If you wouldn't mind, uh, you know, and trust me, I know that you're an extremely hum humble person. Uh, but talk a little bit about your resume and all these credits. I mean, you know, Elton John, Lady Gaga, like I said, Janet Jackson, Neo, Queen Latifah, Joe Jonas. Um, and it seems like you have been involved with a lot of these artists in different areas. Right, right. Well, half of those people I got in through Adam Blackstone. <laughs> <There it is. laughs> which is somebody that I grew up with and 
the things he's achieved. I mean, he's a he's Emmy nominated twenty twenty right now right. Uh, for his Super Bowl thing with J Lo. Uh, so he took it to a whole other plane. But there was a time when him he being sure younger did. than I am that he would call me and probably like, hey, man, I'm just keeping in contact or you know you got any advice, blah blah blah, and. That was short lived because <laughs> <laughs> not too long after that, he was hiring me to do gigs. You know, if he was out of town or whatever, um, then he would call me to fill in just because he knew like, oh, this guy's solid. He communicates well. He can get the right. job done. And then as he started going up, I was right behind him, you know, finding things to do that would... Uh, make it happen so one day he was uh the md for kanye um a massive tour and janet jackson was in the audience and she called uh she found some i don't know how she did it but she called somebody and said i want that musical director <laughs> there you go and it was adam and when he got the gig he called the people closest to him that he could trust he's like man this is the biggest thing i've ever done Right. You know, I'm, I can't do it on my own. Are you down? And we all came through. Um, so that of one good turn deserves another. Uh, between him and then right behind him, Kern Gate was giving me the Neo gigs, the nice. Jessica Simpson gigs. Um, well, that was Gordon Campbell again, but we were all in the same circles with Kern um, doing the Neo thing. So it's just like if everybody's on a gig and they can trust each other and they perform well, and you get a call for another big gig, you just say, hey, why don't we call the same people we've been successful with? That's and right. And that's how that happened. And Kern got me, uh, we did Lady Gaga's first um, uh, TV show. So, Brilliant. yeah, Kern was busy with uh, somebody, Mary or Faith Evans, and he couldn't do, and, and see, Gaga wasn't out yet. So, um, as far as like, uh, I guess priorities and where he had to, his physical body had to be mm. at the time. They were rolling at that time that, you know, Mary already yeah. had multiple Grammys. And here is Gaga, who we know is going to be magnificent, but she is just right. starting. So we're in rehearsals. She was super cool. She knows how to play the instrument. She was showing me stuff on synth bass, which was, I loved it. Nice. And uh, so we're getting ready to do the show. Monty Newble's on the gig as well. Right. And uh, who's the guitar? I want to say uh, Tim Stewart. Tim Stewart, uh, yes. Yeah. He was so, just on a couple episodes ago, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah and, so. And we had Adam as well back episode 17. Sorry, I just wanted okay. to throw that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, these are the guys. This is the fam. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. So, so we're continue. sitting there on, uh, we're on uh, Jay Leno and the, you know how he does his little spiel in the beginning and he holds up then what was the CD. And he was like, welcome, Billboard's number one artist, Lady Gaga. And we all looked at each other like, Billboard number one? So we get through the song. Next morning, sure enough, we looked on the Billboard charts and Lady Gaga came out of nowhere. Like, <laughs> she wasn't even in the top 20 the day before. And the next day she was number one. Look so... Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So basically, it was just relationships that got me there. It's like ah. Just doing my best, coming through, and communicating. That's, and that's the how good stuff. <laughs> that's the good stuff. That's what I'm trying to get to. This is the meat and potatoes. This is what I want all the aspiring uh, career musicians to understand. Mm -hmm. um, it's relation. I always say it's the R word relationships. You can't just walk into a situation and expect things to happen immediately, perfectly, you know, all of a sudden, wow, you're just working and things are great. Yeah. You have to cultivate those relationships. Yeah, yeah right? for sure. And they take a little time to just stew up, you know, it's like, that's right. Anything of quality is just, in most cases, there's this backstory to it. So backstory. You know, Yes. Even if I met somebody with extraordinary skill today, I have to watch them for a little bit because I have too much to protect and it's too many That's people right. depending. So I'm like, OK, well, how do you do when things aren't going too well? Or how do you go? How are you when things are going amazing? <laughs> do, are you going to fly off the handle and be somebody that I didn't see before the success? And right. how do you communicate? Do you disappear at times or? 
even if even if you are going to take a break, do you just send that phone call and be completely transparent? Say, hey, I'm about to be out for two weeks. You know, um, I've had I've given right. up gigs sometimes on that. Like when BB Rexa first came out. And uh, Adam called me for it, but my daughter was living in Tokyo at the time. And uh, I could have missed half of the rehearsals and kind of like wiggled my way through because I had a planned trip out of town to go see my daughter. But I told him straight up, I was like, man, I have this planned trip to go see my daughter and I don't want to jeopardize the energy of the total group. And he's like, dang, all right, well. I got to call somebody else, but he asked me for a recommendation. So I recommended somebody and they love me for it. <laughs> Look at that. And that's how yeah. it works. That is right. how it works. This is perfect because it ties into one of the questions I ask everybody about, you know, etiquette, whether it's touring etiquette or studio etiquette. And this is the, the foundation of this etiquette that we're talking about communication. And, you know, if you're not going to be around, if you're not going to answer your texts or your phone calls or emails, let people know, hey, I'm going to take this little break. I need to do this for a minute. But, you know, if you hit me up, I'll get back to you. Just give me a couple days, you know, but Mm -hmm. I will get back to you. Don't just this whole concept of ghosting. I don't understand it. But, you know, Me isn't, neither, it, man. <laughs> isn't it, it just easier to just say, you know what? Hey, man, I'm not interested. So sorry. Thank you for your time. You know, yeah. just just get it done. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. And it's so it's so, so funny. You mentioned that it's an interesting dynamic. It's like a synergy of being having that integrity and moving up the ladder. So it might seem counterintuitive to not have those hard conversations sometimes, right. but indubitably those are the conversations that people trust you more and you can handle more and they trust you more like having the uh, integrity to turn down a gig because you can't make all the rehearsals or um i'm going to be late or i got to change the date of something but having that hard conversation even i'm dealing with a project now where there's an artist she works on a super high level but I had to tell her, like, we creatively, can you do something with the tracks you sent? Um, and she responded favorably, in which I now understand why she's done things she's done. And in return, while I was, when she said, oh, yeah, by the way, I use uh, Omnisphere. Right then and there, I wanted to do things. I said, I got on, I hit James Bernard at Spectrosonics and I said, hey, I'm working on blah, blah, blah with this. Uh, songwriter and she's using spectrosonics and it's just because of how she handled that situation with maturity and integrity that made it like i felt like okay now we could move into some other realms now and get get these right. endorsements going and maybe possibly i'll call you first for another high profile situation look at that it takes the relationship to a deeper level yeah yeah it does Yep. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. All right. So so before the relationships get cultivated, many of us, uh, you know, who are transplants, we come out here to L.A. in search of work. Right. We come out west to, to, to mine for gold. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. You know, and in the beginning, I remember I came out in 2005. Okay. I, prior to that, I had been emailing all my buddies and, and, and calling, you know, hey, I'm thinking about coming out and, you know, people are like, yeah, come on out. You know, once you get here, let me know. So that's the first thing I did. I sat down every morning for probably two weeks and just made phone calls and emails for three hours every morning. Just, you know, diligently. And sure enough, those relationships start to present themselves. Mm. However, some of them weren't there. So I had to go audition. I'll never forget my first proper audition. Me too. See, there you go. <laughs> I think we all came through that school at that point, at that point in time, you know. Yeah. It was a good uh, probably 10, 20 years of where you had to go through camp, you know. Yeah. Let's talk about the auditioning process. I remember what it was like for me, but I love hearing, you know, perspectives from other people. Once again, with the young career musician, of, you know, with aspirations of coming out to L.A. and getting the gig. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, talk about auditioning. What that was like for you? Um, that was the only audition that I did, surprisingly, ah, and I go. was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I was horrible, man. It, I really was, like, based on the level of the gig, and 
you know, you know him. He's going to tell you the raw, uncut truth. That's right. And I'm so grateful for it, you know, because it, <laughs> it was so raw. Like, it was just like, you, young people, sometimes you might think somebody's hating on you when you get the truth yes. if you're not at that level. But it takes someone with enough courage and uh, even integrity within themselves to one, not, not to lie. They'd be like, oh, no, no, yeah, you were cool, man. And then they don't mess with you after that. That's right. I'm not like that either. Um, I, my style is a little different because I know that I work, I, uh, I, come, I rise to the occasion better with positive reinforcement. Hmm. But I had to mature and learn to, no matter how I feel like it's coming at me, to separate the delivery from the truth and just look at the truth. And my bass was out of tune. I was mm. playing all over the place. And I wasn't, there was, I was not listening to the album and playing the parts <laughs> and understanding my role um, in, the, in orchestration in a, pop, in a pop context. And I got an earful of it. <laughs> That's right. These are such key factors of what goes into an audition. Because remember, yeah. when you audition to play, like you said, in an orchestrated situation, a band, it doesn't matter if it's a full symphony or a four-piece you know, modern ensemble, you have to play your part. You have to, especially with these production artists where everything, sometimes with Janet, it starts with the music. The choreography is built off of the music. The light show is built off of the music. And everything goes to Simply Code. So everything about the lights and the effects <laughs> and the, even the mix. So, you know, when I'm supposed to be holding a football, if I decide to come out of pocket and do something crazy, but the, you know, the engineer has that turned up for an effect. Right. right. It throws them off and... and very, you know, even for drummers especially, or um, every little thing they do on the cymbals, if that's in the music that the uh, dancers get from the beginning, they choreograph to these little nuances. So you got to play the same thing verbatim from that point. That's right. <laughs> and they'll that's... miss it if they if they do a dance move and they don't hear that little nuance, they turn it around and then the vibe gets kind of strange. You know? I, have, I have seen choreographers look back like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they yeah. danced to it 20 times that day to the right. recording. So by the time That's they come right. in the room, and they don't hear. So little things like that. And um, yeah, it helped me to grow. I, after that, not too long after that, I got my first bass endorsement because I was now more sensitive to the instrument right. and the quality of it and the upkeep. And everything about a bass that I could learn in a short amount of time, you know, because I was heading towards being one of the bigger fish in my small pond in my hometown. And then I got to L.A. and it's like, yo, it's a different ball game out here. We're, we're, not, we're not even <laughs> guppies know. when we come out here, right? We're like, exactly. We hope know. somebody will birth us, really. You know, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, well, that's man. that's an amazing experience. I, I have many you know, stories, and they're all valuable, like you say. Mm -hmm. uh, you said something that's really important. We have to learn, uh, perhaps especially when we're younger or older, just depends. Hopefully we learn this lesson sooner than later. You have to learn how to separate the truth from the delivery. Yeah. That's a great line. That's a great concept. Yeah. yeah at this level, I, I found people who have a higher emotional intelligence – get further as well that's right um especially in being artists it's sometimes hard to separate or compartmentalize what you do from who you are so mm -hmm. it's not like i'm saying i don't accept like let's say if there's a a, a player johnny it's not like i'm saying johnny I, i'm not saying i don't accept you as a person because this that you're doing needs to be better you know but uh, even as a pro music producer, I used to really get taken personal when somebody didn't like it. But now I look at it like I want everybody to like it or at least a high percentage of people from a mathematician's point of view. 
<laughs> so if somebody tells me they don't, I take it as a challenge to say, okay, thank you for that feedback because next time you hear this joint, that's you're going right. to love it. <laughs> that's right. And the most successful corporate entities survive by that feedback. Indeed. You know, and you want to work with them. So that's yeah. right. We yeah. need that feedback for ways to, to improve so we can figure out how to, like you said, fine tune those nuances on ourselves. Right. Yeah. 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 Always getting better. And, you know, take not taking it personal. Personal is good for someone's not only their mental health, but their physical health. It's all related. And I get it now. If I walk in the room and I look a little younger than my actual age and people know how old I am, I might get an extra gig or, you know, now it's like consultation in this right. stage of my career. People value my opinion, but I have a piece about me when I come in the room and, and some answers to some really tough questions and a delivery style that keeps everyone connected and peaceful solution oriented that's so right. that's how i'm able to transcend like coming out of a musician i had to take that feedback from the auditions and say okay this is it but then getting into a producer and a musical director in my 30s and now there's musical styles change and people's lifestyles i got my daughter now so now it's kind of consultant people call me on the front end of things because i've done so many things and this is how I carry myself as a, I, I guess I can call it a wisdom artist. <laughs> I'm still an artist, you know. Hey, it's Jay Deal here, and you're listening to the Career Musician Podcast with Nomad in the house. Being a career musician is more than just gigs and sessions. Are you a career musician? Find out on the Career Musician Podcast, streaming everywhere. Subscribe to the brand new Career Musician YouTube channel, now streaming all of the Career Musician podcast episodes. That's right. But, I just yeah. I just love the way you package things up and deliver it. And I noticed something, I think it was on the, the Jam Card app that I hit you up, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. which shout out to Jam Card. Love those guys. What a fantastic. Love Jam Card. Yeah, what a fantastic system they've developed. And Elmo and, and Jack and, every, and Christian, everybody over there. Um, yeah. But you said something on there. You said uh, an altruist. And I said, oh, man, altruism. I love that. You know, once again, I just love your delivery. You know, your wisdom artist, altruism, you know, acumen. These are all term. This is all terminology that I toss around on a daily basis because, like the title suggests, this is a career. Yeah. You know. We don't just play for fun. We don't just noodle around and do a gig, at, you know, like we used to when we were teenagers. Right. We built full-fledged careers out of this. Indeed. I love how and, you put that because I can know, cut grass for money. But if I could also build a team of people and have a landscaping company and build a career. <laughs> now, that's a career. Thank <laughs> that's you. That's a career. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm right. saying? You're not going to run out of clients that way. Versus when you were 14 mowing lawns in your neighborhood for a couple bucks. That's different. But then you right. build a – man, that's yeah. it. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. So, look, I could sit here and ask you a million questions. So I'm trying to be very, you know, pinpointed to get to the real good stuff here. Um, okay. Let's talk about studio because you mentioned a little bit about the touring etiquette and the audition process. But let's talk about studio etiquette. I think, once again, like you use the example, hey, Johnny, it's not that I don't like you as a person. I just think that part that you – played needs to be tweaked we need to flip it like this and i think that happens a lot in the studio i also think that a lot of times again i say this but you know when we have less experience we think we could just blurt everything out that we're thinking in the studio and the mm -hmm. producer is just like hey wait a minute buddy i'm producing this <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> talk about that studio etiquette from your experience yeah, I've, I, I've earned my stripes in that, you know, especially yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a, if you've been blessed to see some things happen at a young age, you sometimes, I know me personally, I, I, I kind of had it twisted in some ways because I had it easier from being exposed to such great situations from people like the Kearns and the uh, Stephen Fords back on the uh, East Coast. Right. Um, and Stanley Brown in New York with Island Black Music, he really put me on. And he was really patient with me because I would see things happening 
And to me, it was like blatantly obvious, like, well, why don't we just do this <laughs> without understanding the other side, the business side of things? Hey, you got to pay these people. You got to invoice people. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, then there's a human resource element like this dude has a right. this dude has a family to go back to. You know, we can't just take a million takes right now. So or producers would sit there and talk to people for a while. And I'm like, yo, let's get to this play. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say these things. And yeah. one key element that I guess I didn't pick up until a little later in my early or, or mid 20s is when somebody who is in a position of responsibility of taking care of things and then they just stop and get silent. And they kind of take a breath and, you know, so at, when I was younger, I took that as, oh, that's open door for me to kind of show what I got. I can kind of help out with my expertise. But really, they were just br bringing themselves down to a point and establishing their, um, I guess, the fact that they were the principal. So it calmed everybody else down in the rooms like, okay. And everybody else that understood what was going on, they're like, all right, let's listen to what the leader is saying right now. So I had to learn that. Um, picking up on those nonverbal cues. On those cues, yeah. yeah. Those cues, yeah. It's subtle so because they'll, 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 they won't come out of pocket and just say that you're messing up. They just won't call you back the next time. <laughs> you know? Ooh, I love that. I have a couple of stories about the no callback. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and and uh, I'm... I'm a different type of guy too because I run into those, but now at the risk of even being misunderstood, I'll try to use it as an education moment and I'll pull them to the side without fronting them and I'll be like, this is something you might want to look out for. And a good 50% of the time, they don't get it. It's the first time somebody's telling them that. If they're not like the son or the daughter of, of someone who's been in the industry and they've or mm -hmm. been exposed at early age, they take mm -hmm. it like, yo, Jay Deal was hating on me. But then they invariably come back years later and be like, you know what? Wow. Yeah. When you told me that, I didn't get it until like a, le a year ago when I was in, in charge. <laughs> right. That's right. And so, sometimes it, ta uh, it takes right. that. It takes that transition right. of position to, to recognize it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's you know, and, and then... Uh, also understanding what is the intention, what's the goal, what's the aim of this thing. Um, and, it's, and in most cases, no matter what role you are, it's not, unless you are the artist and the centerpiece, it's not about you. It's most likely about a couple things in general, like a label and the artist and the producer, or That's the right. song, or the message of the song, or the production of the song. So having those um, objectives in mind from the start and being aware of them will inform how to go about playing your role in that situation. And I think that's something that new players can ask a couple key questions. Why? Like, why mm. am I here? <laughs> why did they that's call right. me? And why are they doing things this way? And that, right. and, you know, yeah. And, and recognizing the fact that there are many people they could call. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you are not special. <laughs> You're yeah. here because they saw something in you and they figured, oh, they saw you know, potential and said, yeah, I can work with this person and this is great and they can fill the position and will be fantastic. But know that you are replaceable. Yeah, yeah, there's three people right? on the list already. <laughs> they might have called one of the other ones first, but right. they were busy and you got it. But they'll yeah. most gladly wait till the other person. <laughs> <laughs> I always say that you don't know if you're number two, three, four, five, or six. Call you don't know which number you are. You just yeah, you, you know, just have to be make it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, <laughs> count your blessings that you're sitting in that chair. Yeah. Yeah. Man, Man. talking about things like rehearsals, and you, again, you're you're saying there's so many other elements that are involved that perhaps we don't see as just you know you're coming in as an instrumentalist. To play a part in this big production with many different spokes in the wheel, right? You're just one mm -hmm. of those spokes. We might not see all these other things that are in play. 
And whether you're in a rehearsal or a studio session and there's downtime, what I always tell musicians, become really good at multitasking. So if you're in the booth, if you know, if you're sitting in there with a live tracking situation and it's you and four or five other musicians and there's some discussions going on in, you know, out there in the, in the control room, Mm -hmm. you know, be chill, be calm. Yeah. You know, and, and if you, if you want to talk to the other musicians, that's great. But as long as you keep it down, you're not acting all crazy and screaming and yelling and laughing, you know, right. Mm-hmm. But if it's a chill situation and maybe you're new, you know, bring a book, read, read something on your phone, you know, just get used to multitasking. Right. Or better yet, yeah. maybe if it's a long rehearsal and you're waiting in the hallway and you're just like, oh man, you know, instead of opening your mouth, Hey, what are we doing? Why aren't we getting this show on the road? Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. That's definitely a vibe. Yeah. It's a Understanding vibe. That. It's a vibe thing. It's energy thing. And yeah. uh, I love, I love how you're looking at it. Like from a time management standpoint, I look at it as a combination of time management and uh, offer and acceptance. This is a legal term. And what, I feel like young musicians should understand when you agree to accept the job at the terms that they're giving them to you, uh, everything that comes along with it, you accept that. You you just accept that, no matter what it is. And if you start to realize it's not for you, you have you might have the ability to unaccept it, <laughs> but take the consequences that come along with it. You uh, know, so yes. don't complain about what you accepted. You know, whether it's the dollar amount, the time that's spent to do it, the way the music is getting to you. And if you feel you're going to climb up the ladder, then challenge yourself to get a better gig. If not, Uh. take what you accepted and do your 100% best at it. Make the most of it. And, And sometimes you have to make decisions to move on to climb up the ladder. I know I did. There was stuff where I was like, no, nah, I can't accept that right now. I can't right. accept that dollar amount for the amount of time you're asking me to put into it. And then I had to accept being home, not getting paid anything until that's something right. better came along. <laughs> I just had that's to accept right. it. Yeah, it's and acceptance. Then, I love yeah, that. And it worked out, you know, eventually, because when I was home, I was like, all right, well, I need to be that guy in Pro Tools. So I would just yeah. go hard. And I wasn't getting paid in currency. I was getting paid in um, learning agility and, and ability and skill sets. I was paying myself. That's right. And then I had extra things to raise my market value when it's time to find other gigs. And then I said, now that, Janet Jackson, let me think if I can accept that. Yeah, I can yes. accept that. Yeah, I can accept that. <laughs> well, I can accept that. You are you are restocking your toolbox is the way I like to look at it. You're making sure that when you walk in, you have the biggest toolbox that anybody's ever seen. Whoa, this guy's skill set is amazing. He could do X, at, Y, Z, you know. At every level, because even this, yes. e- everything's temporary. You know, this season uh, of my life is not going to last for long. You know, right. being a consultant, cool. There's going to be some other cats who are working their way up the ranks from apprentice to finally musician to... Uh, a ranger that regards it's like okay well let me build my own situation <laughs> let me put the money into something that reflects my values and and dishes out the type of entertainment or exposure to the type of music and artists that i'm into and i'm writing the checks or my team is writing the checks and we're putting this out so. that's right i love it perfect segue into my next topic here business acumen you know, and how uh, how growth is such an essential part of what we do. Once again, looking at this as, you know, I'm not just a musician, I'm a business person. Mm-hmm. And, and how does my growth affect, uh, you know, my next stages and, and like having the, the acumen Mm-hmm. To know, yeah. hey, I need to implement this. I need to, uh, I need, I need to uh, delegate and and build a team. Yeah, yeah. You know, I so do, I do that us. for. I do that. I do that for projection out into the world, people who perceive it, the universe, and for myself. Because when I open my LinkedIn page, that's the first thing: acumen, integrity, wisdom, whatever I have up there. It's a message to me sometimes, like, bro, yeah. this is what you want to 
be. This is what you, you've worked on to be. But this is who you are. You're giving my, I'm giving myself that message. But it's also projecting out into the world. What do I want people to know about me? And that, that works for me. I guess people need to find what works for them. But for me, people eventually can find out that I play instruments or I'm connected to USC or that I've done things with Janet Jackson. But I've figured out that putting that statement, putting my mission statement in so many words up on every platform kind of weeds out the people that I really don't care to deal with anyway and attracts a whole nother set of people like yourself, <laughs> you know. Well, thank like, you, ditto. <laughs> yeah, you know, so um, the business acumen part, I just started learning it early. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. as great as these people are as artists who are, right, are signing the checks, like Janet does movies, she has mm-hmm. children, <laughs> and she's not on, on tour all the time. So when she needs to take a break for her, what am I going to do? You know, am I going to mm-hmm. get more clients or am I going to diversify? Am I going to have some fun sitting in a financial instrument that aren't depending on what entertainment is doing right now or how the mu- music, uh, how the record industry is performing? So, right. um, and how can I have them play against each other? How can I use my connections and relationships and music to feel to fuel assets in the financial realm and vice versa? Um, so, I think that's something that people who get that early on in their career and lift the stigma off of what a full time musician is, because you can be a full time in your spirit. But as far as full time with your minutes and hours and your dollars, you know, you're not sitting there doing that 24 7. Let your money work for you 24 7. That's right. (laughs) Talk, talk, preach, man. Preach. Come on, tell us. So it's like, and and I'm not ashamed. It was really 2015. I was literally cleaning toilets in a nursing home in 2015. Because we needed money for my family. That's right. And this is after some big gigs. And yeah. still having a gig at church. You know, but we wanted a life for ourselves that I felt I would take the charge to not uh, just take the setbacks that I had in the industry and just sit around and wait. That's right. So I got my mental health together. And I purposely put myself in a position to uh, appreciate the value of time and money again and mental health in a way. So I was just back to basics for myself, man. And um, it really helped me to, that's how, that's how I worked my way into doing things that got me into USC again. Um, it was total redesign of my career at that point and not being ashamed to be uh, someone that, who handles my responsibilities by any means necessary right. and not feel like it diminished my, me as a creative. And uh, Man, um, you could say that statement a million times over that's so heavy and important for people to understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That it doesn't diminish you as a creator. Not at all. And it's really society that's got it messed up. It's really that's the right. culture that's got it messed up. But we are human we have lives, we have families, responsibilities, and you know, there's a narrow, there's a perception that's so narrow of what success is that's been perpetuated, especially in America, it's capitalistic, it's built on passing dollars around. And the music, the powers in the music industry have no matter how it's been in exploiting that and images of what's successful what's going to make money and they make these decisions and it is very hard to deal with that being a creative especially in this country and it's probably world spread worldwide now but um do i i just posted on facebook yesterday i said choose one would you rather me listen to your music and never buy it or buy your music and never listen to it (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> that is fantastic. And, uh, can I use that? I'm gonna, I'm yeah. gonna have to borrow that, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I did. It was for me too. So when you say it oh, again, it bounced back, and I'm just like, yeah. what are we doing it for? And in a in a yeah. climate where the world is changing and we're challenging how what we think about everything, everything. I, yep. It's going to go back to artistry and it's like, what am I doing this for? Am I okay with being listened to and not heard or somebody just put money into it and they don't give a damn about what I'm saying? But right. at least I'm free on the inside and I'm doing it because this is what I want to do and I'm going to say it the way that I want to say it. And I got a message to get out there in my, my way. You, you just skillfully and so articulately answered my next question without me even having to a- ask it. <laughs> Great question, minds think alike. <laughs> the question was, what are your principles and methods and what does being a career musician mean to you? You just answered it. Man, that is brilliant. Thank you. And I love something, uh, yeah, something else you said. I had to get my mental health together, which yeah. means... And, that, and again, that's not in a negative connotation. That's saying I had to get my perspective yeah. of success and, and being a creator and real life. I had to get those perspectives tidied up, right? You had to do some house cleaning within yourself. Had to. Had to because there's so many other things. And people will, when you say like numbing yourself, people will point to alcohol and drugs, right. which definitely are in that category. But what about being inundated with accolades and numbing yourself that way and uh, yeah. the chase. It could be like, you know, yeah. chasing your love interest or whatever mm-hmm. and getting drunk off of that. And then it's finally like, okay, let me be sober minded and really, what? why am I here on earth for one? <laughs> Existentialism, baby. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Let's get that together for Let's one. Let's get deep. Yeah. <laughs> and then if you got uh, anybody, if you have anybody really that cares about you, and it's, that's just a human condition, being connected. Like, what am I? What's my? What is my position with these people to whom I'm connected? That's and right. how does that interplay? You know. And I was isolated for a long time chasing I, I that's i was going to say that too i allow myself to change my dreams and my goals I, you know I, I it takes a certain amount of rigor and discipline and and uh kind of uh almost narrow vision to go for a goal but allow yourself to change your mind as well if it's for the betterment of your health and the that's relationships right. So I got back to getting cool with my family again um, because I thought they didn't understand me as an artist. Like, I'm moving to L.A. (laughs) Mm, (laughs) What are you chasing out there? No, y'all don't understand me. Uh, And they might. They might not. But I tell my students, I'm like, you, again, that compartmentalization. Understand that they are showing you love in the way that they know how. So accept the love, but let the part that stung for you roll like water down your back receive the love and be cool with them not understanding that you are different and keep it moving well you just answered my last question words of wisdom (laughs) 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 oh man you're funny so so you're reading my mind this is fantastic i mean really but that's those are those are great words of wisdom everything you said is, is is you're a wisdom artist you said i love it so fantastic advice you know because a lot of people well they just don't understand me i'm an artist i'm different yeah. right yeah. but like what you said let that roll off your back and do understand that they're only asking out of the love of the, that they have for you as as the person that you are yeah, yeah. they don't understand what you mean to them yeah if they had right. the same experiences and the same if their brain was wired like yours and they do what you do then maybe they would get it but they just they don't, go. and you just got to understand that they're trying to do the best they can and, and smile at them. I'll never mm-hmm. forget because my, my dad, uh, he's one of my best friends in life, but he didn't understand the music thing. But when I got mm-hmm. that Elton John credit, <laughs> <laughs> the conversation started changing a little bit. Like, he understood, huh? It's like, yeah, son, um, 
we're here for you to support you any way you can. <laughs> and before I wanted to go to college for music, I didn't even make yeah. it into the arts high school in my 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 hometown. I I, I didn't make it in. Really? They said that they didn't see enough innate talent. So uh. he was like, yeah, you're going to engineering school. He said, God has blessed you, Jay. And he did because right. the yeah. math helps. And that's the the last word of wisdom that just ended on. I was, I'm thinking Thank like, you. everyone has their path and you just never know. You know, being a mathematician is one of my biggest assets as a musician today. But I couldn't see that earlier. So... I mean, th- and and I was saving that for the end because to me that is the heaviest, you know, aspect of this. Mathematician, talk about that. So, with that was your original trajectory. This was your original innate talent with mathematics. I think I just happened to be good at it, and I ended up in some good schools. But okay. yeah, I mean, now I'm passionate about it because uh, naturally, as I was getting good at it, um, but music is there's a lot of math involved with everything with physical sciences and music is one of them because you're just pushing airwaves right. and the way those airwaves interact with each other create new patterns and they behave predictably in ways that math can inform you and you can manipulate it and that's how i understand music but that's someone else, incredible yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but what you just said that it's just impacting the airwaves at how do we get timbre and tonality well i guess that's just a different equation of airwaves then right most definitely most definitely the harmonics wow. and all that kind of stuff you know like if you uh there might be an overtone you hear because you're sitting in a room with somebody but you turn the corner you're just hearing the fundamentals and that's Oof. because of the way that the air uh, it lost the power in those higher frequencies, <laughs> uh, you know, wow. um, when it's time to turn the corner, but the bigger airwaves still propagate around the corner kind of thing. And outside. So is, yeah. I love this. Have you done your TED Talk yet? I did. I did. And people were looking for it, but I went over the time limit. And that's why they didn't post it publicly. But... I'm in the process of of editing it and getting it animated, so okay. I can put it out that way. I did I talk a little wait. bit about that. <laughs> I can't wait to see you do a TED Talk on this. Yeah, that's what's wow. up. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's going to be amazing. That's my goal with the career musician. I want to take it to TED, to the TED stage. So. Hey, yeah, that's uh, what's up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is fantastic, man. Good stuff. Bro, I can't wait for us to connect and hang and do more you know, digging with all this stuff. This is fantastic. Would you mind if I ask you some quick, fun questions? Yeah, sure. All right. You don't have to think about it. Just spin them off. Uh-huh. Your favorite food? Pizza. Favorite drink? Water. Ah, favorite sport? Lacrosse. How do you spend your free time, assuming you have any? <laughs> Free time. <laughs> I know, right? I love that one. That's why I always th- say that. Right? <laughs> exactly. What's free time? What is this word you speak of? Free? Right. Free? <laughs> free time. <laughs> oh, man. I Now I have some work to do on myself. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, 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 I was about to say spend time with my daughter, but I actually right. schedule that because I got to clear things away so that's I right. know that that's happening. That's right. Uh, drive or be driven? Ooh. Empathy. <laughs> you said, you said I, say the same first thing that comes to mind right i love oh, that okay i love that yeah because i'm speaking in uh in a very uh literal sense like uber or drive yourself but i love the fact that you said uh, empathy you took it a whole nother level See? oh yeah I, I took it as like whatever the situation calls for do i need to drive the ship or do i need ship to be, be driven be- by the ship i love it <laughs> I love it. We're leaving it right there. We're leaving it right there. <laughs> what activities do you enjoy on long flights besides catching up on sleep? Pro Tools. Ah, see? Yeah. 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 I Dang, know my past. I... Yeah, my neighbors get mad at me sometimes because that <laughs> light is on. <laughs> right. Right. Hey. <laughs> I've over the past year before the pandemic and when I was still flying, of course, over the past year of traveling, I was learning Ableton. I was teaching mm. myself Ableton. So on those flights, I was just chipping away at that, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's Love the best it. place to do it. It's like, it what, is. Else, what else are you going to do? 
Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, the last song, band, or artist that you listened to that you had nothing to do with. You just listened to for, for fun. Uh, the Mandalorian soundtrack. Ooh, don't you love that? I love it. You have you heard it? So cool. I'm, I'm like glued to the television with yeah. the whole series. And lo- yes. Is this season <laughs> out yet? I only saw no, the first season. Just season just one. one. Okay, got gotcha. it. I'm late. I'm late to the game. I uh, we just got Disney Plus a couple weeks ago for okay. my daughter. <laughs> yeah. And we watched it as a family. Oh man. Check that out whole... this, the check out the soundtrack on any of these streaming services. The yeah. music alone is it's killing just... man. I know. I have a decent system hooked up to the TV, and every time I heard the theme, I'm like, wow, now that's a powerful theme. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Love that. Love that. All right. Yes, good, good, good. Uh, song, well, let's say band or artist that really made an impact in your life, that changed you, changed the way you thought about music. You know? Yellow Jackets. Yellow Jackets. Yeah, between nice. them and Maurice Ravel. Maurice from oh see yeah. I love that oh we didn't get to talk about that your classical background too yes okay mm, I love yeah, that yeah, you have yeah. both sides I'm the same way yes okay good 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 uh, favorite TV show or movie now I know The Mandalorian might yeah, be one of them Star or? Wars okay. I've, I haven't owned a TV since uh, 2001 so ah great yeah I haven't seen any I've, I've seen about three movies in the last 10 years in the theater but I've seen all the Star Wars right gotcha 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 gotcha. yeah 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 what we're similar age i remember man coming up uh, with the little action figures and all the star wars stuff i mean that's 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 beautiful shopping online or brick and mortar online okay and your dream dream collaboration you've had so many already but if you could dead or alive if you could say man i this is my dream (sighs) yellow jackets yellow yeah there you go yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's Bob Mincer uh-huh. on Horn. And tell run through the band again. Yeah, Bob Mincer on Horn. Uh William Kennedy on drums. Right. Um Jimmy Haslip on bass. Haslip, that's right. And Russell Ferrante on keys. On piano. Keys. And three of them are USC professors. So when I walked in my first day and they and and Russell Ferrante and Bob Mincer were like, Hey Jay I was like, Oh, <laughs> God, I can't believe it. My Dream name is of- my name is right next to Russell's because of alphabetical order on the roster in pop music. Russell Ferrante, J. Deal. Every time I see it, I'm like, yeah, what is going on? Come on, man, that's amazing. So your dream came true. Yeah, it really is. A, that's why collaboration wise, it, yeah. it kind of is in the education space. You know, we're in the same entity. But wow. yeah, yeah, a lot I of my dreams it. came true. All right, this last question is usually easy, uh, not so easy to answer, but I have a feeling I kind of suspect the answer. What would you do if you weren't a career musician? And because I know your propensity for math, I kind of suspect it might be there. You know, mm-hmm. Is that true? If you weren't a career musician, what do you think you'd be doing? A lawyer. A lawyer. Yeah, most I like definitely. That. I yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. I could see it. Yeah, cause I I I feel they can help people. So, yeah. And my dad, he <laughs> successful in his own right, and he went out and got a law degree, and just it never intended on being a lawyer. He said, "I just want the knowledge so I can help people." That's so, awesome. Yeah. Wow, Jay Deal, this has been a treat to have you on the career musician podcast man. oh man this is awesome i'm so grateful that you called me thank you and i can't wait to uh the way you set it up and prompt these because i don't talk like this all the time (laughs) (laughs) yeah you're you're a master interviewer and it's like you get it thank you so i really appreciate you man ah thank you so much i can't wait till we can collaborate on something in some manner yet to be determined <laughs> oh i'm about to hit you up watch i got something ah, for you <laughs> that's beautiful beautiful yeah all right yeah. my friend yes until the next gig if you've enjoyed today's interview please leave a review and subscribe to the career musician podcast help us continue to provide you with new and engaging content by getting our ratings up please subscribe and leave a review on apple podcasts I'm just a nomad, nowhere man 
writing the songs in this one man band. I know man. This is Nomad, host and creator of the Career Musician Podcast, and I am thoroughly stoked to be an official member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Pantheon Podcast Network is the first of its kind as an all-music-based podcast collective. Please be sure to check us out at pantheonpodcast.com for more info.